So to kick off, our first speaker is uh, uh, Radha Rajaskam from the United States of America. He is the um, infectious disease doctor and researcher, and uh, his uh, primary research evaluates uh, cost-effectiveness strategies to prevent opportunistic infections in persons with advanced HIV prevention. And he will be uh, presenting on the evaluation of uh, a national uh, critical cocoa antigen screening program for HIV-infected patients in Uganda, a cost-effectiveness modeling analysis. And let's bring it, uh, him up to do the paper. Thank you. Good morning. Cryptococcal disease causes 15% of AIDS-related deaths. As you can see from this map, the majority of cases occur in Sub-Saharan Africa, where mortality is 50 to 70%. Mortality is so high due to delays in presentation to care, the need for complex management, such as serial lumbar punctures, and difficulties in accessing optimal antifungal medications. As a result, there are an estimated 136,000 deaths annually. However, cryptococcal meningitis can be prevented. Cryptococcal antigen is, can be detected in the blood before onset of meningitis, and preemptively treating those who are asymptomatic but CRAG positive with fluconazole is life-saving. This has been most rigorously evaluated in the REMSTART trial in Tanzania and Zambia, where alongside adherence counseling, cryptococcal antigen screening and treatment resulted in a 28% survival benefit. As a result, CRAG screening and preemptive treatment is now recommended by the WHO and numerous national HIV programs. The objective of our study was to evaluate the costs and lives saved of a Ugandan national CRAG screening program for people with a CD4 count under 100 per WHO guidelines. We also extended this analysis to a universal CRAG screening program in an HIV test and treat scenario where no CD4 testing occurs. For our base case model, we assumed 1 million people get CD4 tested, 16% have a CD4 count under 100, and we assumed 80% of these people who are eligible for CRAG screening would actually get tested. We assumed that 80% of those who are tested actually return for results. This 80% is simply an estimate um, just to account for an imperfect screening program. We assume that 8% of people with a CD4 count under 100 were asymptomatic and CRAG positive, and this is taken from prospective cohort studies in Uganda. If a person was found to be asymptomatic and CRAG positive, we assume that only 80% of them receive treatment. Again, this is so that we have a conservative estimate and we're assuming an imperfect screening program. And then we made survival estimates based on prospective studies from Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa, with and without treatment. If a person was found to have cryptococcal meningitis, we assumed 80% were hospitalized, and we um, estimated survival in, in the hospital and then six-month survival based on um, large randomized control trial and prospective cohort studies from Sub-Saharan Africa. Input costs are seen here. On the left, you can see um, some basic CRAG screening costs. The test itself, the CRAG lateral flow assay, was assumed to cost $3.41, including shipping and um, lab overhead costs and labor. The course of fluconazole used to treat asymptomatic CRAG positive people was estimated to cost $39 US dollars. On the right, you can see the cost of treatment for meningitis. 
We assumed that everyone would be hospitalized for 14 days, so there were room and board costs. Everyone was assumed to be treated with amphotericin and fluconazole for 14 days, which is standard of care in our setting. People receive lab testing um, because they're re receiving amphotericin, so electrolyte monitoring and creatinine testing. We included the cost of hospital personnel, doctors and nurses. Everyone was assumed to receive one diagnostic lumbar puncture and two therapeutic lumbar punctures. And there are some miscellaneous hospital supplies. So the total hospitalization cost for meningitis treatment was $563. So in the base case model where people got CRAG screened if they had a CD4 count under 100, in the scenario where no CRAG screening occurred, we estimated 4,272 deaths from cryptococcal meningitis. There was no cost to screen and treat because no screening was occurring, and the cost of meningitis care in the hospital was $3.7 million. So total costs, outs including outside of the hospital, was about four million U.S. dollars. In the scenario of a uh, CRAG screening program, we estimated 2,755 deaths from meningitis. The cost of the screening and treatment piece of it was $731,000. The cost of meningitis care for this group was $2.4 million. So the total cost of the CRAG screening program was $3.3 million. So when you compare CRAG screening to no CRAG screening, CRAG screening averts over 1,500 deaths related to cryptococcal meningitis and saves $700,000 of costs, saving $453 per death averted. And just to clarify, when Typically when we use the term cost effective, it means we're using money to save lives. But what I'm saying here is with the CRAG screening program, the Ministry of Health would actually save $453 per death averted. Another way of looking at these results is in this um, graph form. Across the x-axis, you have proportion CRAG screened and treated. On the left side, you have 0% CRAG screened and treated, and as you move to the right, you have increasing proportion screened and treated. On the left y-axis, you have cost in U.S. dollars, and on the right-sided y-axis, you have deaths. As you move from the left, which is no CRAG screening, to the right, which is full implementation of CRAG screening, you can see that the bars are reducing in size, and the bars represent cost here. And the main change from the left to the right is the green part of the bar, which is going down, and that is the cost of hospitalization. The horizontal blue line represents deaths. So as you move from left, which is no CRAG screening, to a full Im implementation of CRAG screening, you're also reducing deaths. With perfect implementation of CRAG screening, meaning 100% of eligible people are screened and treated, we estimate you could save 1,900 lives and save $860,000. Now moving on to the universal CRAG screening program within an HIV test and treat scenario, we're assuming no CD4 count is conducted and everyone who enters HIV care is eligible for CRAG screening. Here we assumed 1 million people entered care, 80% had a CRAG test conducted, 80% of those people return for results. And the CRAG prevalence, so the proportion who are asymptomatic and CRAG positive, was 1.4%. With no CRAG screening, we estimated 3,800 deaths from cryptococcal meningitis. There was no cost to screen and treat. The cost of meningitis care was $2.89 million, and the overall cost was about $3 million. With CRAG screening, we estimated 2,180 deaths. The cost to screen and treat is significant at $2.18 million. The cost of meningitis care was $1.5 million, and the total cost was $4.1 million. So here we're we find when we compare CRAG screening to no screening, CRAG screening averts 43% of deaths related to cryptococcal meningitis. 
at a cost of $1.08 million. So in this scenario, it would cost $662 per death averted. I can show you these results in a similar graph where across the x-axis you have proportion screened and treated. And you can see that the costs, which is represented in the bar part of the graph, go up as you move from the left, which is no screening, to the right, which is full implementation of CRAG screening. And as you move from left to right, the blue part of the bar graph, which represents the cost of actual screening, goes up significantly. And the reason for this is you're screening a much larger population with a very low prevalence of CRAG positivity. You can see the blue horizontal line that goes across is going down, meaning you're, um, there are less deaths as you go from no screening to full screening. With a perfect implementation of this program, one could uh, expect to save 2,033 lives at a cost of $1.3 million. So in conclusion, a national CRAG screening program in the setting of CD4 testing and CRAG screening for those with the CD4 count under 100 is likely to be cost-saving and life-saving. Availability of hospital care, hospital costs, and the treatment regimen for meningitis is integral to the cost-effectiveness of a national CRAG screening program. Universal CRAG screening in an HIV test and treat environment is likely to be cost-effective based on the overall CRAG prevalence of 1.4%. Here, CRAG screening, all HIV-infected people averted 43% of deaths from cryptococcal meningitis at a cost of $662 per death averted. I'd like to acknowledge all of our collaborators, Bruce Larson, who is my primary mentor for this project, our colleagues at the Infectious Disease Institute, CDC, and the Ugandan Ministry of Health. Thank you. Thank you. So we have actually time for uh, two or three questions. Can we just come up to the mic? In addition to or other than cannabis. If um, so let's uh, yes, go ahead here. One. Yes. Um, Keith Crawford, Division of AIDS, National Institutes of Health. Thanks for your very important work. So I have a question on the timing of OI treatment in relation to heart. Um, so with cryptococcal meningitis, the advice is to treat the meningitis first before starting antiretroviral therapy. Do you know what the optimal time is for treating CRAG positive people? Can you start heart if they're asymptomatic and CRAG positive, or do you treat with the fluconazole before you initiate antiretroviral therapy? Thank you, yeah, I think that's a really important question and, and we don't know the answer to that. We would love to do a study to evaluate that. In our study, and what's likely true is that people with um, a low CRAG titer, with a low burden of cryptococcal antigen, potentially might do okay with starting ART immediately, but what we worry about is people with a high titer um, would be at risk for iris and sort of fulminant meningitis. So we don't know the answer to that, um, but it's an important question. Okay, Hi, go uh, ahead. Tom Campbell from uh, University of Colorado. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the type of uh, CRAG methodology that you used for your scenario, it looked like it was not point of care uh, because the patient had to come back for a result. Yeah. And I was wondering if you did any modeling with other methods, including point of care methods, and how that affects uh, the cost. Yeah, so um, we assumed that we used a cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay, uh, which, and we used it, or we assumed that it was used in the lab reflexively. So if your CD4 count was under 100, you would automatically automatically get that test done. That was the only scenario that we looked at. Um, there have been studies in South Africa where they've used providers, sort of they've had providers order the test, and that way it's done sort of um, point of care, but the problem is there was poor uptake because providers forgot to do it or 
So in, in general, we've looked at a lab-based reflexive testing. Okay, go ahead. I'm Shirish Balachandra from CDC Zimbabwe. Um, thanks a lot for presenting this. As you probably know, we've also um, had an implementation science protocol on, on cryptococcal screening using the lateral flow assay. There are two things that, that for us complicated um, the assessment of the mortality benefit, um, and I'm curious if this was an issue for you all. One was the the uh, question as to whether the patients who ended up uh, serum crag positive would or would not consent to an LP, you know, therefore uh, compromising to, for those who did not, compromising our ability to establish disseminated disease and treat for meningitis and, there, and thereby seeing a mortality eff uh, protective effect or not. The other is identifying these patients and potentially treating them for either preemptively for asymptomatic uh, uh, disease or, or for meningitis, and then having them uh, succumb to TB because mm. the, 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 the study didn't also, Im didn't necessarily improve upon the standard of care for TB diagnosis or treatment, and that, that was a challenge. Um, I was curious if either of those things came up for you all. One other small question is in your last, the, the last graph, uh, the one that showed uh, the impact of universal rather than CD4 dependent screening, uh, maybe I misunderstood, but it looked to me like the, the bars were getting bigger towards mm -hmm. the right, which means the deaths were increasing? No, that means that the cost was going up. Um, so it costs more money to do screening compared to no screening. So uh, then the... Uh, okay, the, the, so... so uh, I think it, you could catch up with, uh, with Dama later on, so you could just briefly make sure. comments there. Um, so it's a good point. Um, when you do CRAG screening, in, in our setting, if someone consents to an LP, that's great, but I think symptoms are really important in this scenario. So if they're completely asymptomatic and they don't consent to an LP, we would preemptively treat them with fluconazole. If they have symptoms, that gives us... Um, we, we can do sort of further counseling about the importance of an LP, um, and oftentimes we can explain to them why we need to do this. Okay, thanks Thank once you. again, Dama. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> the next presenter is Dr. Dama Imran, who is the neurologist uh, from the uh, University of Indonesia. So he will be actually presenting a paper which is looking at uh, uh, HIV-associated central nervous system infections in Indonesia, looking at a cohort study examining etiology, presentation, and outcome. Dr. Imran, please. Good, mo good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the organizing committee for inviting me and support me to attend this wonderful conference. I'm going to present HIV-associated central nervous system infection in Indonesia on behalf of our uh, study team. I have no conflict of interest. Indonesia is the fourth most, most populous countries in the world. The HIV prevalence is low, but according to one publication in Lancet, Indonesia is the second fastest growing HIV epidemic in Asia. Uh, I work in the university hospital in Jakarta. I do not consider myself as a researcher, but I try to get a better understanding of my patient. Before I present the data, I would like to, I would like to share some barriers to diagnosis and management of 
sinus infection or brain infection. Patient with brain infection may not realize they have serious condition or their family may not realize this, they have serious condition. And they may not access adequate healthcare facilities. The doctors may not suspect sinus infection or may not perform a lumbar puncture, a tool that is very important to diagnose sinus infection. And even if they do the lumbar puncture, sometimes they have no diagnosis because negative result in sinus infection is very common. Recently, we have interviewed 288 neuro Indonesian neurologists. 40% of them had no lumbar puncture in the last three months. And still 35% think that HIV status is contraindication for lumbar puncture. Some of them have limited uh, access to uh, diagnostic tests and special uh, treatment such as amphotericin B. Therefore, we conduct this cohort studying adult with suspected sinus infection from January 2015 until April 2016. We conduct a systematic screening in a clinical laboratory and follow up the patient for six months. Our microbiological testing consisted of primary testing in the cerebral sp spinal fluid and the second line testing on CSF in the archive samples retrospectively. These are the predefined diagnostic criteria that we use to define a definite, probable, and presumptive diagnosis. For a final diagnosis, we reach by consensus among study team after all of the test results available. The treatment, in according to national guideline, Initial treatment usually include TB treatment because most of our patients present, presented in subacute disease and TB is very common in our hospital. So usually we uh, start with TB treatment unless we can find Another diagnose, such as toxoplasma based on CT scan or cryptococcal meningitis based on uh, microscopy. These are the results. After exclusion of 66 patients with alternative diagnose, we include 274 patients. All of these patients tested for HIV. And we found that more than half HIV positive. Lumbar puncture was done in 182 patients. If there is no lumbar puncture, mainly because of the risk of brain herniation. Our follow-up almost complete, 100% in hospital follow-up and 98% in six months follow-up. These are the baseline characteristic. Comparing patient with HIV infected and HIV negative. As you can see, most of our patients presented at the hospital more than two weeks two-thirds of these patients were unconscious and many with seizures and motor abnormality, such as hemiparesis. These are 
the patient that were very, very severe condition. Regarding to the etiology, the most common diagnosis is toxoplasma encephalitis, followed by TB meningitis, confirmed in 44 cases, 44 percent, and followed by cryptococcal meningitis and viral encephalitis, especially uh, CMV. But we still have no diagnosis in, one, in almost one third of the patient. Focusing on HIV history and ART, almost half of this patient newly diagnosed with HIV. And the other half had previously diagnosed with HIV. And in that group, more than half never received antiretroviral. Some already stopped antiretroviral, and only 30% in that group still uh, using antiretroviral at the time of presentation at the hospital. HIV RNA measurement is not routine in our setting, but in subgroup of our patient, we can measure plasma and cerebrospinal viral load. In the red line, you can see the, the plasma and cerebrospinal viral load in patient with knife, uh, IRT knife, and the blue line is in the patient with ART history. Only 15% of patients with ART has viral load below 500 copies. The mortality, the mortality in this study is very high. Besides the severity of disease in the baseline, the major risk factor for mortality is HIV. In HIV group, the in-hospital mortality 37%, and after six months follow-up, we can only have one-third of the patient still alive. Patient with lower CD4 counts and with higher fire load were more likely to die. We, have, we found no significant difference between mortality between toxo, TB, and crypto, and the unknown etiology. Maybe because the number were too small. In conclusion, more than 50% of CNS infection in our hospital were HIV associated. The mortality is high and much higher in HIV positive patient. 52 of HIV positive patient already previously diagnosed with HIV, but only 30% still on IRT, of whom less than 50% suppressed HIV RNA. This study underlined the need for earlier testing and better long-term HIV care and HIV resistant testing and management of uh, opportunistic infection. I would like to thank my study team and collaborator. One of my collaborators is uh, here, Prof. Reynold van Gravel. I would also like to thank our patient and their families and thank you 
for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for that. And uh, this paper is now open for discussion. Please come to the mic. Yes, please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Elena Vieta from Argentina. I was wondering, why do you have such a little percentage of patients under prophylaxis with cotrimoxazol? It was only 14% as, as I've seen. And the second question is, if you have preventive therapy or prophylaxis with INH. Thank you. Thank you very much for your important question. Yes, we have uh, INS prophylaxis, but also it is not uh, in the high scale. For cotrimoxazole prophylaxis, uh, actually it is difficult to, to record in our medical re record because many of patients that coming to our hospital not just from our clinics, many from referral from other cities. And sometimes it is not easy to, to find their history of cotrimoxazole. But that's true. We, we need to look again why the cotrimoxazole prophylaxis were so low. Thank you very much. Okay, left back. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know if you have done any uh, study for prognostic factors. You have a high rate of mortality among positive and the negative. Mm -hmm. Have you done any comparative study for prognostic factor ex to explain this high rate of mortality, why this, this patient recovered and why the other not? Because I have done a similar study and we looked for six prognostic factors. One of them is the biochemistry of the CSF, where we found sugar level, low sugar level is, carries a negative prognostic factor. I wonder if you have done anything like that, as well as type of organism, especially among, in a comparative way between positive and the negative. May I get a response, please? Why Thank I raise you. this question, sorry. Why I raise this question? Because you, you have got 274 cases, so it's a good opportunity for you, uh, really. What you have done is very good, but if you, if you continue what you have started, if you still have the samples, to do some more biochem biochemistry study of the CSF. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, we try to analyze in multivariate the prognostic uh, factors yes. in, this in this study. And we found that uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, papil edema, and low glucose in CSF yes. was more uh, in severe outcome yes. than yes. the Even others. If you allow me, Mr. Chairman, to add so, one, one So more I think it, because of the timing, uh, yes. so you have actually uh, constructive observations will allow you to have okay, some discussions with the presenter at one point in time because we have to move on with timing. Thank so you. I think uh, we'll, we'll stop there for now. And I apologize. Thank for, you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So thank, thank you. you once again. So the next presenter is Dr. Daga uh, Bandari, who is uh, coming from Nepal. He's a leading HIV expert uh, and in public health uh, from since two, 2006, and uh, he has contributed for national guidelines and the training curriculum in, in the HIV in the country. And today he's going to be presenting about the burden of sexual transmitted infections and prevalence of HIV among key population individuals presenting with STIs in Nepal. He is uh, a technical advisor to Linkages program. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, first, I'd like to thank you 
thank for this organizer organizer for providing this opportunity and i am presenting uh, on behalf of my calling colleague who are listed here so uh, so let me start with a little bit background according to the who uh, nearly 1 million people get a, infected every day with any of the four curable STI, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. And uh, use of biomedical prevention methods as like uh, antiretroviral therapy, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and post-exposure prophylaxis also may affect the behavioral patterns, use of condom leading to the increased STI. Despite all these facts, relatively little attention has been given to sexually transmitted infection. So, Nepal uh, is a country with uh, concentrated HIV epidemic with an estimated prevalence of 0.15%. And so, uh, HIV is concentrated in the, mainly in the key population. These are listed by the government of Nepal as a key population. And we are committed to meet the UNH goal of 1990-90 by 2020 and also ending it epidemics as public health threat by 2030. So as country is focusing and finding new cases of HIV and enrolling them in treatment, and we are, and STIs are getting relatively less attention. So, uh, it it doesn't mean to uh, mean that we do not have any uh, we do not have STI. The slide represents results of IVBS integrated biobehavioral survey done in Nepal in 2016, in 2017, and different. Uh, epidemic zones of the country. HIV among female sex worker is relatively higher in Kathmandu Valley, and syphilis among female sex worker was highest in Tarai district. Uh, at the same time, high prevalence of syphilis was also reported among MSM and transgender uh, population uh, in the Tarai district. If we see the total clinic visit, if we see the total clinic visits in government outpatient clinic, 0.62% clients are visited had uh, visiting had STI. So we also have STI. So a little bit about uh, linkages Nepal. Linkages Nepal. Uh, Linkages stands for the linkage across the continuum of HIV services for the key population affected by HIV project. It is a USAID and PEPFAR flagship project addressing HIV prevention, care and treatment among key population in Nepal. So it is implemented in 16 districts of Nepal from the duration of October 2016 to 2019. And it provides STI prevention, diagnosis, and case management, HIV and STI prevention, diagnosis, and case management service to female sex worker, client of female sex worker, men who have sex with men, male sex worker, and trans people. Overall, individual uh, offers all the individual presenting for STI service, HIV testing, and vice versa. So, uh, we, uh, in linkage, we have very good coordination with the government, and we, we are uh, run, uh, running this program uh, along the partnership with the government also. We represent in the National HIV Technical Working Group. We get the supply of uh, test kit, reagent, and medicine from national logistics system. So, and we actively link uh, pe uh, people living with HIV identified in linkages clinic with uh, identified link with the government antiretroviral therapy center for treatments, and we follow the PLHIV in the community through peer navigators, and this include those PLHIV who are identified in the government clinic also. So we have very good coordination with the government of Nepal. So STI case management and uh, Linkages Nepal includes all the activity listed here from demand generation 
to syndromic management of uh, management of STI in clinic and syphilis screening and treatment with benzoate and penicillin, condom distribution, and up to the healthcare waste management. So this slide shows the uh, shows the burden of burden of STI and prevalence of HIV from 2016 October to 2017. So uh, during last one year period of that period, which is mentioned there, linkages Nepal uh, screened 23,000 individuals and around 5,000 were identified uh, with STI. Among the total uh, uh, cases of STI, we identified 42 cases of HIV. That was around 0.7 percent. And so. Uh, among, if you see the graph, that 69% uh, of uh, key population were uh, diagnosed with venereal di uh, vaginal discharge syndrome, so we provide syndromic approach, and followed by 13% uh, of syphilis, and then 10% uh, around urethral discharge syndrome, and we had around 4% genital ward. If you see the in the uh, uh, blue light blue boxes just rep, uh, presented over the bar. These are the HIV prevalence among this group. So you see the syphilis, uh, almost three percent uh, prevalence among the cases with syphilis. Uh, we have uh, almost two percent prevalence of HIV among the cases with genital ward, and around 0.4 percent among the vaginal, uh, vaginal discharge syndrome patient and around 0.2% with the urethral discharge syndrome. So if we uh, group, uh, so we try to see the burden of STI among uh, the HIV positive client, uh, the 42 HIV positive client, and you see the almost 50% HIV positive client were suffering from syphilis and around 38% has got vaginal discharge syndrome, and around 10% uh, genital warts, and 2.4% uh, with urethral discharge uh, syndrome. So, so uh, in conclusion, we see we see that uh, STI burden among key population, uh, key population program beneficiaries is very high, and many KP members living with HIV are also co-infected with STI. And providing integrated service helps link a large number of KP individuals to needed STI service and, and, and the resource-limited setting like in Nepal. All individuals presenting for HIV testing should be examined, tested, and treated for STI, and vice versa. And STI should not be left behind, should be continued with HIV case finding, treatment, and retention activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now this paper is open for discussion. Let's move up to the mics, please. Going one. Okay. Sorry, me again. Sure, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Elena Vieta from Argentina, thank you. Uh, we were wondering how do you make chlamydia diagnosis and screening for it in men who have sex with men? Which techniques do you apply if you have them as screening techniques? Do you understand the question? Yeah, do I make yeah, yeah I thank understood you. the question. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, the, any diagnostic screening test for chlamydia and gonorrhea in Nepal. Uh, everything, uh, this diagnosis was based on the syndromic approach only. And we treat chlamydia and uh, gonorrhea together with azithromycin and cephic gym in combination as following the syndromic based approach. Okay, thank you. At the back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a good study, but I would like just to stress that the relation between STIs and HIV, it's bidirectional, where both potentiate each other in uh, causing infection and in prolonging the course and the resistance to treatment. 
So this has to be very clear for all of us as clinicians, that it's bi-directional and uh, they potentiate each other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the last one here. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I just want to find out from your vaginal discharge syndrome, since this is a syndromic uh, diagnosis, um, uh, is so much. Uh, where is the contact tracing and the, the partner, the urethral discharge, is not showing there? So how do you balance this off? Is that really the actual sexually transmitted or is it, ure uh, is it a red productive tract infections like candida and other things that are contributing to your vaginal discharge? So, vagina, uh, this uh, vaginal discharge syndrome, uh, actually it is also based on the syndromic uh, diagnosis, based on the symptom. But uh, the, we, uh, in the past we did uh, a little bit investigation, lab investigation. We found uh, uh, the candida infection and trachomatis uh, vaginalis. Uh, infection and a little bit uh, cervical infection was responsible for that. Okay. And for the contract testing, yes, we do the partner testing for the, all the HTI infected uh, uh, patient, and it is uh, voluntary partner testing, not the active one, but the passive one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, So, we've looked at the evaluation of the National Cryptococcal Antigen Screening Program. We've looked at the HIV-associated central nervous system infections, and we've also looked at the burden of sexual transmitted infections, which have been discussed to say that probably we're not paying more attention to the STIs as we scale up HIV programs. So now we are shifting gears to malignancy, Kaposi sarcoma, and I'm handing over the next part of the session to my co-chair, Margaret. Margaret. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Hugh. Um, it's, uh, I have pleasure in introducing Dr. Admar Chikandiwa, who is a graduate at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, who's a secular and reproductive health physician with over 10 years of experience working in sub-Saharan Africa, his interest is in infectious diseases, including STIs, and his presentation today is entitled The Natural History of Anogenital HPV Infection and Related Disease Among HIV-Positive Men. And these are findings from a cohort study in South Africa where he is based in Johannesburg at the University of the Witwatersrand. Thank you, Dr. Chikandiwa. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, persistent high risk in... HPV infection causes almost 90% of the 35,000 cases of anal cancer that are reported globally. And uh, particularly now it is important because the cases of anal cancer are increasing, particularly among people living with HIV and men who have sex with men. We know that HIV alters the natural history of HPV infection, meaning that people living with HIV infection, they are more likely to have prevalent HPV infection. They are also likely to have persistent infection and more likely to progress to HPV-related diseases. So I used the cervical HPV as a mo model because we understand a little bit better about it. Uh, we know that among all the infections, 70 to 80 percent of the infections of uh, the cervix, they clear within a year. But it is important to note that almost 20 to 30 percent of these infections, they persist. And over time period, they progress to low-grade lesions and even high-grade lesions. The important thing about this slide is that we have a window period of about nine years where we can detect these lesions early and act upon to prevent invasive cancer. So if you understand the natural history of anogenital HPV infection among men in a similar way, we can tailor-make treatment and even prevention strategies to reduce the burden of disease among men. Um, I've got some key terms. So in the presentation, persistent infection was defined as men who had HPV DNA positive result at enrollment and at follow up, which is 18 months later. Persistent seal, which is short for squamous interepithelial neoplastic lesion, was defined as men who had seal lesions in anal cytology at enrollment and also 
seal lesions in anal cytology and follow up. Clearance of anogenital warts was defined as men who had anogenital warts detected in enrollment, but there were no warts detected at follow up, which was again 18 months. And the reverse, instant warts were defined as detection of anogenital warts at follow up among men who had no warts at baseline. So the objective of this presentation is to describe the prevalence of anal HPV infection, genital HPV infection, and also related disease among men living with HIV. The second objective was to characterize the correlates of persistent anal HPV infection, genital HPV infection, and also persistent seals among these men. We also wanted to understand the correlates of clearance for anal genital warts. So the study was done in Gauteng, which is a central province in South Africa. And we enrolled 304 HIV positive men, followed them at six monthly intervals for up to 18 months. 92% of the men attended the month six visit, 85% of the men attended the, eight, the 12 months visit, with 80% of them attending all the visits up to month 18. At each visit, we collected social demographic data and medical history data. We also collected CD4 count, and viral load data to monitor the HIV disease. We collected anal swabs and genital swabs to test for HPV DNA. We collected anal smears, con conventional anal smears, which are classified by BESIDA classification, which is basically what is on the further right. So they could be either negative for interepithelial malignant, which is neom, they could be ASCUS or ASCH, or low grade squamous interepithelial nucleostic lesion, which is LEOC or HCO. So at baseline, these men had a median age of 38 years, with a quarter of them having at least uh, two sexual partners. Only 5% of the cohort identified themselves as men who have sex with men. They were largely on ART 65%, with a median CD4 count of 445, and uh, slightly above half were viral suppressed. Then at baseline, 79% of the men had gentle HPV infection. So HPV was isolated from the penile swabs. And uh, in the anal canal, the prevalence of HPV infection was 39%. So we were interested in persistence of this infection. So when we looked at the 260 men who had HPV infection at baseline and also have their results at follow-up, you can see that 30% of them were positive. And when you follow this 30%, we can see that 26% of them could not clear the infection, so they had persistent infection, which is a risk of progression of disease. In a similar way, when you looked at uh, the 259 men who had genital HPV results at both enrollment and follow-up, at baseline, 74% of the men, which is almost 192 men, had HPV infection. When you follow them at month 18, 35% of them had not cleared the infection, so persistence was 35%. This slide, we're looking at the effect of CD4 count on persistent infection. So the blue graph is anal HPV infection. Yellow graph is gentle HPV infection. On the y-axis is pers HPV persistence, and on the horizontal axis is CD4 count. So as you can see, as the CD4 count increased, the, the likelihood of persistence was reduced, and that trend was significant. So CD4 count drives the persistence of HPV infection. When we looked at the anal seals at baseline, we had results for 244 men. Half of the men, 50%, they had no lesions, so they were normal. 19% had ASCAS lesions, and 29% had low-grade lesions, but they were no ASCH or high-grade lesions. So when we followed these 120 men with abnormalities, which means the ASCAS and the low seal, this is what we found out. 47% of them actually cleared the lesions on their own. 15% regressed, which means they moved from LC to ASCAS. And 7.5, uh, which is the yellow, they progressed, which means they moved from ASCAS to low seal. But it is very important to know that 30% of these men had persistent lesions. So it means they remained either ASCAS or they remained either low grade. Um, this slide shows the effect of persistent anal infection actually on the persistent lesion. So the graph on the left actually shows that if the man had persistent, any persistent HPV infection, they had almost four times more likely to have persistent anal seals. And in a similar way, if they had persistent high-risk 
infection, which is the graph on the right, they are almost 6.5 times more likely to have persistent uh, anal lesions. Uh, when we looked at anal genital warts, the prevalence at baseline was 12%. The incidence rates over the 18 months follow-up was 1.4 per 100 percent years, which is similar to what is reported in Southern Africa. But it was interesting when we looked at the men that had anal genital warts at baseline and followed them at up to 18 months to see the time to anal genital warts clearance. So as you can see on this graph, on the y-axis is the proportion who still have it was, and on the x-axis is the time since enrollment. So the median time to anal genital warts clearance there was 0 0.7 years, which translates to almost eight months. This is defied the fact that these men were being treated by podophylline pain, which is the standard treatment in Southern Africa or in, in South Africa. And they had to come several times to the clinic, which means increased patient costs and also increased time with the clinicians who were seeing them. Um, when you looked at CD4 count, this graph shows that a CD4 count greater than 350 uh, was statistically significant in determining earlier time to clearance for anagental wards, as those graphs, they are very distinct. So in terms of a summary, we can say about a third of the anogenital HPV infections in NLCs are persistent. And uh, that persistent infection is actually associated with a low CD4 count. And the persistent infection actually drives the persistent anal lesions. And uh, we also saw that the anogenital ward clearance was highly influenced by a CD4 count. There are some limitations because of the testing intervals, which is 18 months apart, so we could have missed other infections that happened in the intervening period. And we also used anal cytology which as a proxy for anal histology because we do not have high resolution alloscopy which is required to get the, the anal histology. So just to sum it up, HPV prevention could be best done by HPV vaccination. This is simply because the role of uh, screen for anal cancer among men is not very clear, especially with our data showing that there were no high grade lesions. And also, it's not very feasible because the technology such as high resolution endoscopy is not available in most uh, low income settings. Uh, the current available treatment for anogenital was is not very effective. And uh, also, at times, the high levels of, ad of adherence that are required to have uh, immunological reconstitution to kind of control these uh, HPV related infection and diseases, they are very difficult to achieve in uh, many low income countries. So if the HPV vaccine could be made cheaper, or if one dose is found to be effective, then we should be vaccinating these men as well. Those are my references, and uh, I would want to acknowledge my funders and my co-authors and people who helped me to put this side together. Thanks very much, Dr. Chikandira. So we have time for one or two questions. Perhaps we could start on this side. Thank you. The first microphone. Yes, hi. I'm wondering if you have any data on the genotype of these viruses and if there's an association with some of the more oncogenic genotypes and the persistence of HPV and also the association with lesions. Okay. No, thank you. Um, yes, we used Rochelina Ali, which picks like 37 types. So there was a strong association with uh, the usual oncogenic types, type 16 and type 18 but I couldn't fit it all in the presentation just because of time. Thank you. The first microphone on the side. Artist Mo from UCLA, thank you very much for your talk. Did you collect any data on the CD4 count nadir of the participants as well as their smoking status since those are also linked to the development of anal cancer? Sorry? Did you collect any data on the CD4 count nadir, their lowest CD4 count in their medical history as well as their smoking status? Yes, we have that data, but it was not always complete. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, we can move on. Thanks very much, Dr. Secondary. <laughs> so our next speaker is Dr. Roman Palit, who is a, a young um, HIV uh, specialist working in a French university hospital. His clinical, re and clinical practice and research involve ART management. Uh, he's involved in an HIV reservoir study and sociological studies on MSM patients living with HIV. And today's presentation is on Kaposi disease in HIV infected patients with suppressed HIV viremia. 
Um, this is the experience of the French National Multidisciplinary Committee on COVID. Thanks very much, Dr. Pellet. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here to present this French work about um, the Kaposi disease in HIV-infected patients with suppressed HIV viremia. Some, first, some words um, to introduce Kaposi disease. The epidemiology of Kaposi has dramatically changed over time. The, um, the Kaposi incidence has strongly decreased since 1996 with the use of protease inhibitors and the use of highly active antiretroviral combinations. You can see on this graph the strong decrease of Kaposi disease over time on the middle curve. However, despite immunological and biological control on art, HIV-positive patients remain at high risk of developing Kaposi disease, and for this reason, as clinicians, we have to manage incident and recurrent Kaposi in our patients. The French Committee on COVID is a national and multidisciplinary committee, bringing together several experts to discuss cancer cases occurring in HIV-infected patients. It takes place every two weeks by teleconference and using a specific form completed by the clinicians of the different centers. The goal of this committee is to provide advices for diagnosis, therapeutic approaches, and prevention of drug-drug interaction between art and chemotherapies. From May 2014 to December 20. 17, more than 500 cases were discussed regarding more than 400 patients from 90 centers. As you can see, the Kaposi disease is the second most represented pathology just after lung cancer. The objective of the work I present here was to describe the clinical, biological, and therapeutic characteristics of virally suppressed HIV-infected patients with Kaposi disease. <clears throat> to focus on patients with suppressed viremia, we included H patients with HIV plasma viral load under 50 copy at the time of Kaposi diagnosis for the current episode, of course, and on art for at least uh, 12 months. The current episode of Kaposi disease could be a first episode of Kaposi in patients who had never had Kaposi lesions in their history, or it could be a recurrent episode with new lesions of Kaposi in patients with previous Kaposi disease in their history. We conducted an observational study from Oncovi committee data from May 2014 to November 2017 Data on patients and on Kaposi disease came from Oncovi forms, and in the second time, we called back the different center to complete missing information and to update patients' evolution. So, 72 patients with Kaposi disease with, uh, were presented to the committee. We had a first group of 21 patients with suppressed viremia, with a plasma viral load under 50 copy at the time of Kaposi diagnosis and on art for uh, at least 12 months. We had a second group of 39 patients with unsuppressed viremia with plasma viral load upper 50 copy or on art for uh, less than 12 months. And for 12 patients, missing data did, did not allow us to classify them into the first group or into the second one. Here is the characteristics of the 21 patients with suppressed viremia. 81% of them were men, 45% originated from France and 50% from Africa. They were 54 years old in median. They had a time from HIV diagnosis of 14 years. The, their time of biological suppression was three years. They had a CD4 nadir. Uh, at about 200. Their treatment included a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors in 32% of cases, a protease inhibitor in 21% of cases, and an integrase inhibitor in 47% of cases. They had a CD4 count at the time of Kaposi diagnosis at 450, and a CD4-CD8 ratio at the time of Kaposi diagnosis at 0 0.58. Now look at the distribution 
of CD4 count at time of Kaposi diagnosis, half of patients had CD4 upper than 500, one third of them had CD4 between 2 and 500, and only 20% of them CD4 uh, under 200. The median CD4 count for the patients with a first episode of Kaposi was 375, and for patients with a recurrent episode of Kaposi, 478. Regarding the Kaposi disease's characteristics, the first question was, was it a first episode or was it a recurrent episode? 14% was first episodes in patients who had never had uh, lesions of Kaposi in their history. 60% were recurrent episodes. The second question was, what were the localizations of the disease? All the patients had skin lesions, 20% a lymph node involvement, 20% a bone involvement or a bronchi involvement, 14% an esophagus or a stomach involvement, and only one patient with a mucosal involvement. The third question was, had these patients previously received a treatment for the current episode of Kaposi disease at the time of the case presentation to Oncovi committee? 33% of these patients had not received a treatment, and 47% uh, of these patients had previously received a treatment, 78% a treatment by anthracyclines, 33% a treatment by taxans, and of note, two patients had received other treatments than, uh, than anthracyclines or taxan due to toxicities to, the, to these two families of drugs. The proposals of the Oncovi Committee for Kaposi Disease Management were 14 treatment initiations, included three with other treatments um, has, uh, than anthracycline or taxan due to the same problem of toxicity. Other strategies were three treatment continuation, two therapeutic abstentions, and two patients without proposals awaiting further examination. The proposals of the Committee for Art Management were 17 treatment continuation and four treatment modification, including three, including, sorry, three for drug-drug interaction prevention. For the analysis, we called back the different center to find out the becoming of patients, and we, we've recovered information about 16 patients. Six patients had a regressive Kaposi on treatment, six a stable disease on treatment, and four patients with a progressive disease despite our therapeutic proposals. In conclusion, with this work, we highlight um, Kaposi disease in HIV-infected individuals with sustained biological suppression. Indeed, these patients have a controlled immunological and biological situation with more than 10 years of HIV infection evolution, with three years of biological suppression and CD4 at about 450. These patients raise several problems for their therapeutic management. We've seen a majority of patients who are referred for a recurrent Kaposi. We've seen many patients had previously received treatments, one or more treatments for their Kaposi. And some patients remain progressing despite ongoing treatments. The toxicity of conventional chemotherapies can limit their use, especially in patients who are aging more and more with a lot of comorbidity, with the risk to reach a therapeutic dead end. Of course, this work has several um, limitations. This is a retrospective cohort with many missing data based on Oncovi specific form, and this form is not really suitable for clinical research. The number of cases presented here is small, and probably there is a selection bias because all the cancers occurring in HIV uh, infected patients can be presented to Oncovi committee, but all the cancer occurring in these patients are not presented to this, to this committee. So perhaps um, we are aware of the most problematic cases. As perspectives, the Conservi Working Group is able to federate a large number of centers in France, and we plan to constitute a prospective cohort of Kaposi disease occurring in HIV-infected patients. And on the other hand, 
a recent work show that a low CD4 CD8 ratio is a risk factor of developing Kaposi disease in patients with suppressed um, HIV replication. This work is presented at this conference and the reference of the poster is given here. We, we know also that there is an alteration of human herpes virus 8 specific immunity in HIV positive patients developing Kaposi disease. This immunity should be explored in HIV controlled patients. And finally, we could propose the evaluation of alternative therapeutic strategies as immunotherapies, as NTPD1 treatment, probably very interesting in this context. I would like to thank all the patients, including in this work, and all my colleagues, especially my colleagues of the Cancer Study Group. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kulich. If there are questions, um, so the first microphone on my left. Thanks, Dr. Uh, I'm Susan Cran from New York. Um, Thank you. That, that was very interesting, and it's very lovely that you have a way of communicating with your colleagues um, around the country. But I'm a little confused about the designation of recurrent KS. Does that imply that they were successfully treated and had a complete response previously, and this is a new appearance? Because, it, at least in my experience, it's far more common for people, even with high CD4 counts, to have persistent KS that never completely goes away. And that seems to be more of a, a more common problem than a complete response and recurrence. So I'm just wondering where those patients fit into your system. Yes, for recurrent Kaposi, um, you're, you're right. There, is, uh, there are patients with Kaposi in their history uh, maybe they had uh, some treatments and clinicians declare them uh, cured for their Kaposi. Cured or not evolutive during several, several years without treatments. And do you not like the word sarcoma? Sorry? <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in your choice of Kaposi disease as opposed to Kaposi sarcoma. Ah. Okay. Um, this term is a debate uh, between us two, so. Uh, thank you. Could I have the first person at this microphone, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Agnes Moses from Malawi. Thank you for the nice presentation. I was just wondering, since your country seems to be well resourced, if there's any data on the levels of HHV-8 at baseline or at follow-up, which would probably have an um, implication on the interpretation of the results. Thank you. The, the delay? The Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus or HHV-8. Did you do levels uh, at baseline or on follow-up? Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, no, we have no the information. Uh, we have the information for um, some patients uh, in our center, in the main center of the study, but we have no information for the other patients. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Balachandro, I think the last question. Thank you. Thanks a lot again from Zimbabwe. It's fascinating. Uh, I'm curious if, um, if I remember correctly, if you looked at all of the Kaposi disease patients, about 20% of them had, uh, at the time of diagnosis, had a CD4 under, under 200, right? Uh, if you s disaggregate them by those who were presenting for the first time, presumably not persistent or recurrent disease, but primary, um, did those segregate more or skew more towards the under 200 CD4 category or, or, or not? Uh, uh, there are this this number. Uh, oh, the, oh, this is just for the first episode. Ah, okay. No, we we are not we are not able to classify them uh, between these two groups. Yeah. Thank you. 
yes. <laughs> we will try to, to make that thing. Mm. Okay, we have one minute, so thank you. Would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes, Artis Mo from UCLA, thank you very much for your presentation. Did you capture any data about additional immunosuppression your patients may have received, such as corticosteroids, TNF inhibitors, um, methotrexate, anything that might have tipped them off into Kaposi sarcoma? No, I have no this information, but I think no. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Pillu. Thank you. So, our last speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Chow from the United States. She's an Associate Professor of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, and she's a medical oncologist with an infectious diseases background, and she's going to present um, our, some data on the Kaposi sarcoma incidence uh, remaining unchanged among African-American men in the southern United States, and these are U.S. cancer statistics data between 2000, the years 2000 and 2014. Thanks very much, Dr. Cha. Thank you, Dr. Barak, and thank you to the um, meeting organizers for um, allowing us to present our data at this meeting. So I'm presenting on the behalf of all my uh, co-authors listed here. Um, I have an, I'm an uncompensated advisor to Celgene, and uh, one of my coworkers receives grants from Merck for hepatitis C research. Um, so as an introduction, um, prior to effective antiretroviral therapy for HIV case, risk was elevated to over a thousandfold for people living with HIV compared uh, to the general population. Um, and since the widespread availability of ART, um, the worldwide incidence of KISS we've seen already today has decreased. Um, the percent decline is lower in sub-Saharan Africa as compared to other parts of the world. And in the U.S., um, in particular, the KISS incidence uh, rates have decreased 83.5% uh, in 1990 to 95 and, and sort of similarly in 96 through 2002. Um, so, Prior studies of KS epidemiology uh, in the U.S. have focused on the use of the National Cancer Institute's SEER data, Oops. and um, that there's higher incidence of KS has been associated with increased poverty. Uh, there's some data to suggest that uh, in southern SEER sites, KS incidence was increased among African American men, um, and the limitation of this data is that uh, this is only focused on registry confirmed cases in about 10 states in the United States as well as some other select um, populations. So we um, decided to try and look at uh, a similar study using um, the complete United States cancer statistics registry data. So um, this data was assessed through the CDC's wide-ranging online data for epidemiologic research platform, or WONDER. Uh, we assessed these data in December of 2017. All incidence cases were, KS cases were coded with the ICDO classification, and we limited uh, the cases to males age 20 to 54 um, because these comprise the majority of HIV-related KS. Uh, so we made heat maps or chloropleth maps of average age-adjusted rates of incidence AIDS-related KS uh, or what we assume to be AIDS-related KS in all 50 states for four consecutive three-year time periods starting in 2003. Um, for KS, we use the WONDER data. For AIDS, which is what our comparison, we used uh, CDC uh, and CHHSTP registry. Um, I'm sorry. And then the trends in annual KS incidence rates use the NCI Join Point program um, for the KS WONDER data. So our results, um, there were uh, t over 12,500 cases included in this analysis. Um, this is a map of AIDS and KS AIDS related incidence rates uh, per year per 100,000 population um, for each of the four time periods involved. The top um, maps are of AIDS cases. Um, and the bottom are Kaposi sarcoma. And you can see the incidence of AIDS cases decreased sort of um, through time, with the last time period being 2012 to 2014. For KS, it also seemed to decrease. However, you can see that there remains a pocket of um, elevated KS incidents uh, focused primarily in Georgia. 
So we went ahead and uh, used our join point calculation to look at age-adjusted case incidence rates per 100,000 by geographic region, splitting the U.S. into the Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. And you can see, actually, um, in all four uh, areas, there was a significant increase of, I'm sorry, significant decrease of Kaposi sarcoma, um, the smallest decrease being um, in the Midwest, um, and it, you can see that um, in the south, oops, um, the, uh, in 2014, the rates were higher than the rest of the country, other, other parts of the country. When we looked specifically by metropolitan area for the top five total numbers of cases, um, you can see that in the Atlanta uh, Georgia metropolitan area, these had the highest number of cases, and the incidence, um, although has a trend of increasing, was not statistically significant, but was certainly not decreasing uh, like in the others. This is the KS incidence rates per 100,000 by age, and you can see that the largest decrease was among the 30 to 44-year age group. Um, there was no change in the 40 to 54 um, um, age group, and there was a statistically significant increase, oh dear, among, um, sorry, there was a statistically significant increase among the 20 to 29 age group. This is the age-adjusted incidence um, by race and ethnicity, and all were statistically significantly decreased. Sorry about this. Sure. And then this is, um, I'm not sure if something is happening with the slides. I can't seem to control them. Um, okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> um, so this is the um, KS incidence for by, eth rate, by ethnicity. I'm not sure if there's. Do you think we could get? To... I'm sorry, the um, data or the IT person at the back of the room. Could we have some help, please? Thank you. All right, I'm just gonna keep going. So this is, um, this is by race ethnicity for the total US, and all the, it has decreased for all race ethnicity. This is by African American men by age, and you can see uh, there's a statistically significant increase in uh, 20 to 29 year old African American men. Um, and then this is by geographic region, um, and the, uh, you can see that all of the other geographic regions in African American men have decreased uh, except for um, those in the south. Um, there's, uh, an, it has decreased but not statistically significantly, which is the black line. Okay. Um, so in summary, between 2000 and 2014, the um, annual percent change of KS significantly increased among age 20 to 29, decreased in 30 to 44, and was unchanged among men age 45 to 54. Among African American men, uh, the rates, uh, the percent change rate significantly increased in the 20 to 29 age group, and there was no significant change in the incidence rates in the southern United States. Uh, finally, among the top five MSAs, KS incidence annual percent change did not statistically significantly decrease in Atlanta, Georgia, and in 2014, the KS incidence there was twice that of New York City. So for future directions, uh, KSHV epidemiology and case treatment and prevention research should focus in the U.S. should focus on closing the persistent gaps in regional, racial, and age disparities identified in KS incidence. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and the project staff and our funding agencies, which included uh, NIAID and NCI um, and the VA Center of Excellence. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Chow. Have we uh, any questions? No? So, um, I was curious to know whether your surmise that poverty is is, is a, a, an important factor in in the persistence of the high numbers in the south. 
I'm curious about the factors that you attribute to um, the persistence of that focus so, in the cell. Yeah, so um, there's been data to suggest that, um, you know, the HIV um, epidemic and in incidence is highest in ages 20 to 29-year-olds, um, mm -hmm. particularly in the southern uh, U.S. and particularly among um, men who have sex with men who are minorities. Um, so I'll, there may be um, some kind of uh, interaction between the fact that in the southern United States there's less access to care, less HIV testing, um, and the persistence of the HIV epidemic um, as well um, as, um, so they have less access to care. Okay. And, and potentially some KSHB epidemiology that may be different than the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you. There. So if there are no other questions, I want, to, it's, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending and particularly to thank our six speakers for such interesting sessions. Um, this is such an interesting session of, present, of uh, presentations on opportunistic infections and STIs. So thank you all very much and thank you for keeping to time. Um, thanks a lot.